Australia dumped half a million beetles onto land, so dead it looked like a parking lot. Six months later, the dirt was breathing again. Water was soaking in instead of running off. The beetles had eaten their way through a problem that cost farmers billions. Sounds impossible, until you realize what actually kills farmland in the first place. Keep watching and find out. Picture this. You're a farmer in rural Australia. It's 1960. You look out at your paddock, and instead of grass, you see a carpet. But not the good kind. Stinking, steaming carpet of cow manure. Everywhere. Your cattle are walking on it. It's piling up. The grass underneath is suffocating. The smell. Let's just say you've stopped inviting people over. And here's the kicker. You can't fix it. You wait for it to break down naturally. But it just sits there. Weeks turn into months. The patties dry out and form a crusty seal over the soil. Rain hits them and runs straight off, taking your topsoil with it. Meanwhile, the grass your cattle actually need to eat is dying underneath this fecal fortress you never asked for. Welcome to Australia's dung crisis. Yeah, that's really what they called it. So how did Australia end up with a poop problem that threatened to bury the entire agricultural industry? The answer is both simple and absolutely wild. It all comes down to one fact. Australian animals never evolved to deal with cow dung. Let's back up. For millions of years, Australia was doing just fine. It had kangaroos, wallabies, wombats, all kinds of marsupials dropping their business across the continent. And the ecosystem handled it beautifully. Native dung beetles evolved over millennia, would swoop in, roll up those marsupial pellets, bury them underground, and boom, fertilizer. The system worked, but marsupial poop and cow poop, completely different beasts. Marsupials are browsers. They eat leaves, shrubs, and produce small, dry, fibrous pellets. Basically nature's little fertilizer pills. Easy to break down. Cow poop, on the other hand, is a wet, massive, splattered mess. It's the result of an animal that eats grass, lots of it, and processes it through four stomachs. That's over 4,000 pats a year, per cow. Now multiply that by the 25 million cattle that were grazing across Australia by the 1960s. That's 100 million cow pies per day, every single day. The native beetles took one look at this imported disaster and said, nah, we're good. They wouldn't touch it. They didn't recognize it as food. It was like offering a sushi chef a deep fried Twinkie and expecting them to work with it. So the dung just sat there, piling up, hardening, smothering pastures. At one point, scientists estimated that cow dung was covering and ruining nearly 6 million acres of Australian pasture land every single year. 6 million acres. That's roughly the size of Vermont. Just gone. Unusable. Buried under crap. But wait, it gets worse. Because the dung wasn't just suffocating the grass, it was also creating a five-star resort for the most annoying creature on earth, the bushfly. These things bred in the dung by the billions. And I mean billions. At peak infestation, there were so many bushflies in rural Australia that people developed something called the Aussie salute. That's the constant hand-waving motion in front of your face just to keep flies out of your eyes, nose, and mouth. Tourists thought it was charming. Australians thought it was hell. The flies didn't just annoy people. They spread disease to livestock. They contaminated food. They made outdoor life unbearable. And they kept multiplying because, surprise, cow dung is the perfect breeding ground for them. Each pat could produce thousands of flies. So now you've got suffocating pastures and a fly plague. Fun times. The Australian government tried everything. Chemicals. Burning the dung scraping it off, encouraging birds to eat the flies. Nothing worked. Chemicals were expensive and poisoned the environment. Burning released carbon and didn't solve the underlying issue. Birds couldn't keep up. By the mid-1960s, Australia was staring down an agricultural catastrophe. Farmers were losing grazing land at an alarming rate. The economics were brutal. Less grass meant fewer cattle. Fewer cattle meant less beef and dairy. The entire industry was at risk. Some estimates put the economic damage in the billions over the following decades if nothing changed. Enter Dr. George Bornemissa, a Hungarian-born entomologist who'd survived World War II and made his way to Australia to study insects. In 1965, he looked at the dung problem 
and had a thought so simple it was almost insulting. Why not just import the beetles that evolved to eat cow dung? The rest of the world didn't have this problem. Europe, Africa, Asia, all these places had cattle for thousands of years. And all those places had dung beetles that co-evolved with cattle. They ate cow dung like it was a Michelin star meal. Different species for different climates. Different dung consistencies. Different seasons. Nature had already solved this problem everywhere except Australia. Bornemissa pitched the idea to the Australian government. At first, they were skeptical. Import foreign beetles? What if they become invasive? What if they disrupt native ecosystems? What if this is just a ridiculous waste of money? But the alternative was doing nothing. And doing nothing meant watching millions of acres turn into biological dead zones. So in 1967, the Australian Dung Beetle Project officially launched. And it became one of the most ambitious ecological engineering projects in history. Here's how it worked. Scientists traveled the world. They went to Africa, Southern Europe and Asia. They collected different species of dung beetles from regions with climates similar to various parts of Australia. Each beetle species had its own niche. Some preferred wet dung, others liked it dry. Some worked in summer, others in winter. Some buried dung deep, others shallow. The goal was to create a dream team of beetles that could handle cow dung year-round across all of Australia's diverse climates, from tropical Queensland to temperate Victoria from the hot, dry interior to the cooler southern coasts. They didn't just grab random beetles and toss them onto farms. Oh no. Every species was quarantined, studied, tested for parasites and diseases, and carefully screened to make sure they wouldn't harm native species. This was science, not a gamble. Each beetle had to prove it could survive Australian conditions, reproduce successfully, and actually do the job it was brought in for. Between 1968 and 1984, Australia imported and released 55 different species of dung beetles. Some failed. The climate didn't suit them. Or they couldn't compete with other insects. Or they just didn't take to the new environment. But many did. And the ones that thrived changed everything. Let's talk about what dung beetles actually do. Because it's not just about eating poop. It's about what happens to the soil when they do it. A dung beetle lands on a fresh cow pat. Then, it gets to work. Some species are tunnelers. They dig vertical shafts directly underneath the dung, pulling chunks of it down into underground chambers. Others are rollers. They carve out a piece, roll it into a ball, sometimes several times their body weight, and roll it away to bury it elsewhere. There are also dwellers, beetles that just live in the dung pat itself and lay eggs there. But here's the magic. When beetles bury dung, they're not just cleaning up the surface, they're performing soil surgery. Each tunnel they dig aerates the soil. It's like poking holes in compacted dirt, letting oxygen, water, and nutrients penetrate deeper. The buried dung becomes fertilizer, but not on the surface where it's useless. It's underground, exactly where plant roots need it. Studies have shown that a single cow pat processed by dung beetles can improve soil structure, increase microbial activity, boost nitrogen levels, and improve water infiltration by up to 50%. 50%. That's the difference between water running off and causing erosion versus soaking in and feeding your crops. And it gets better. When dung is buried quickly, fly larvae don't have time to mature. The flies lose their breeding ground. Within a few years of dung beetles being introduced to an area, bush fly populations dropped by as much as 90%. The Aussie salute became a lot less necessary. By the 1980s, the results were undeniable. Farmers reported healthier pastures. Grass was growing where it hadn't in years. Soil quality was improving. The economic benefits started rolling in. More productive land meant more cattle. More cattle meant more income. Some estimates suggest the dung beetle program has saved Australian agriculture over $300 million per year. Every single year. That's billions over the life of the program. But this isn't just an Australian success story. It's a lesson in ecological problem solving that the whole world has started paying attention to. Because soil degradation is a global crisis. And beetles might just be part of the answer. Let's zoom out for a second. Healthy soil is everything. It's the foundation of agriculture, food security, and entire ecosystems. But modern farming practices have been absolutely brutal on soil. Tilling, monocultures, overgrazing, chemical fertilizers, 
pesticides, all of it strips away organic matter, kills microbes, compacts the earth, and turns living soil into lifeless dirt. The United Nations estimates that we're losing 24 billion tons of fertile soil every year due to erosion and degradation. That's 3.4 tons per person on Earth every year. If we keep going at this rate, the world could run out of topsoil within 60 years. 60 years. That's not some distant apocalyptic future. That's within most of our lifetimes. And when soil dies, everything else follows. Crops fail. Deserts expand. Food prices skyrocket. Entire populations are forced to migrate. It's not dramatic to say that soil health is a matter of survival. So what does Australia's beetle experiment teach us? That nature has solutions we've forgotten about. That sometimes the answer isn't more technology, more chemicals, more intervention. Sometimes the answer is letting the ecosystem do what it evolved to do. Dung beetles aren't just poop processors. They're ecosystem engineers. And they're not the only ones. Earthworms do similar work. Aerating soil and breaking down organic matter. Fungi create vast underground networks that connect plant roots and move nutrients around. Bacteria fix nitrogen from the air and make it available to plants. Soil isn't just dirt. It's a living, breathing, interconnected web of organisms that makes life on land possible. But we've been treating it like an inert growing medium, like hydroponic substrate, something to dump chemicals on and extract food from. That mindset has brought us to the edge of disaster. Australia's dung beetle program flipped the script. Instead of fighting nature, they worked with it. Instead of trying to engineer a chemical solution or develop some high-tech fix, they asked a simpler question. How did the rest of the world handle this? And then they just borrowed the answer. The success of the program has inspired similar efforts around the globe. New Zealand faced a similar dung crisis and launched their own beetle importation program in the 1980s. It worked. Pasture productivity increased. Fly populations dropped. Farmers saved money. In the United States, native dung beetles exist, but many struggle with the sheer volume of waste from industrial cattle operations. Some states have started studying whether introducing more efficient beetle species could reduce the environmental impact of feedlots and pastures. In parts of Africa where overgrazing and soil degradation threaten food security, researchers are looking at ways to boost native dung beetle populations to restore degraded land. It's not just about beetles eating dung. It's about restoring the biological processes that keep soil alive. And this brings us to a bigger idea. Regenerative agriculture. It's a movement that's gaining traction worldwide, and it's built on principles that look a lot like Australia's beetle solution. Work with nature, not against it. Restore ecosystems. Don't deplete them. Focus on soil health as the foundation of everything. Regenerative farms use cover crops to protect soil. They rotate livestock to prevent overgrazing. They minimize tilling to preserve soil structure. They avoid synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that kill beneficial organisms. And they actively encourage biodiversity, both above and below ground. The results speak for themselves. Regenerative farms often see increased yields over time, not decreased. They require fewer chemical inputs, which saves money. They sequester carbon in the soil, which helps fight climate change. They're more resilient to droughts and floods because healthy soil holds water better. And they produce food that's often more nutrient-dense because the plants are growing in truly fertile ground. Australia's beetles are a small-scale example of what regenerative thinking can achieve. But the implications are massive. If beetles can bring dead soil back to life, what else can we restore? There's a term for this. Ecological restoration. It's the idea that ecosystems, even ones we've damaged or destroyed, can be brought back, not by brute force, but by reintroducing key species, removing invasive threats, and then stepping back to let nature do its thing. It's happening in oceans where removing certain fish species allows coral reefs to recover. It's happening in forests, where reintroducing apex predators like wolves changes entire landscapes. And it's happening in soil, where something as simple as a beetle can turn a wasteland into a thriving ecosystem. But here's the catch. None of this is magic. It requires understanding. You can't just dump beetles anywhere and expect miracles. Australia spent years studying which species would work in which regions. They tested, monitored, adjusted. They didn't get it right the first time. 
Some beetles failed, some thrived. The program succeeded because it was thoughtful, evidence-based, and willing to adapt. That's the real lesson. Ecological solutions work, but only if we respect the complexity of what we're dealing with. Soil isn't simple. Ecosystems aren't simple. You can't treat them like machines where you swap out a broken part and expect everything to run smoothly. You have to understand the relationships, the feedback loops, the dependencies. Australia got lucky in some ways. They had relatively isolated ecosystems, which made introducing foreign species less risky than it might be elsewhere. They had government funding and scientific expertise. They had farmers desperate enough to try something unconventional. Not every region will have those advantages, but the core principle holds. When we destroy natural processes, we create problems. The problems often solve themselves. Australia's farmland didn't need chemicals or machines to come back to life. It just needed the right beetles doing what beetles do best. So here we are, decades later, and those beetles are still out there, millions of them, descendants of the original 500,000, working 24 7 to keep Australian soil healthy. They don't ask for payment. They don't require maintenance. They just do their thing, generation after generation, keeping the ecosystem balanced. And that dead farmland from the 1960s, it's alive again. Grass is growing. Cattle are grazing. Soil is breathing. All because someone had the sense to look at nature's solution instead of trying to engineer a human one from scratch. It's not a silver bullet for all soil problems. Industrial agriculture, deforestation, those are massive challenges that require systemic change. But Australia's beetle experiment proves something important. Nature can heal if we give it the tools and get out of the way. The soil came back to life. Not through chemistry or technology, but through half a million beetles doing what evolution designed them for. Sometimes the best solutions are the ones that were there all along. We just have to be smart enough to use them.